suck it up. Get over it. That's what we were always told. We were never allowed to have emotion. As she mentioned, I am a paramedic, have been for 24 years. I joined the volunteer fire department when I was 19 years old. I'm not doing that math for you. <laughs> but during my entire adult life, I've been doing this. I've been watching and seeing people in their worst. Suck it up, get over it. You have to get back out there. Man up is what we keep being told. Well, I'm here to tell you that I have post-traumatic stress disorder. For a while, that was something I hid, I was afraid of. I didn't want anybody to know about. But I embraced it finally, and it took a few things. So my story is what I'm here to tell you today. What I'm here to tell you is suck it up and get over it doesn't work. In fact, it makes it a lot worse, a lot worse. See, some of the problems that we have, post-traumatic stress disorders, become out in the forefront. The military, our returning veterans, have really brought it out and made it more prevalent in society. People are able to talk about it. If our heroes, if the people who were the strongest and the bravest of this country could suffer from this debilitating disease, and yes, it is a debilitating disease, you'll hear about that in a moment. If they can do it, then what about the average paramedic? Now, I'm not about to sit up here and tell you that I have experienced anything like combat whatsoever. However, the trauma on a day-to-day -day basis, the tragedy on a day-to-day -day basis. So EMS has always been the little brother of the police department and the fire department. We've never had the respect or any kind of the rights that all the other ones have gotten. They don't even get our title right. Anytime you hear anybody say police officers, firefighters, and emergency workers, can you get my title right? No, or the dreaded, even worse, ambulance driver. That one I love. Yes, I drive an ambulance now and again, but it doesn't define who I am and what my education shows. It doesn't define it. So when I think ambulance driver, I still think that the public still thinks to this day that we all have white coats, white pants, we drive souped up Cadillac ambulances, we run as fast as we can, we scoop up the patient, we bring them to the hospital. That's not the way it is. Besides, can you see me in white pants? <laughs> that right off the bat would make me define another career. But I never got into this for accolades. I didn't. I didn't get into this to to be on the level of the police officer, to be on the level of the firefighter. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I wanted to go to work every single day and save a life. Now, no, you don't save a life every single day, but you can make a difference every single day. But along with that difference, along with that wonder, along with the good jobs, comes a lot of the bad ones. And I'm also here to tell you that it isn't the big things that make us worse. The 9-11s, the Oklahoma City bombings, the Parkland shootings, those are terrible incidents, tragic, absolutely tragic, and will devastate a practitioner, devastate a provider, devastate police officers, firefighters, anybody who's involved. But it's the little things, the day-to-day -day stuff, every single day going to work, the infant, the two-month-old in cardiac arrest that you know you can't fix, you know your efforts are futile, but you're trying like hell anyway. The 80-year-old, the man who was married for 60 years and he was in cardiac arrest, that you're on the floor trying to resuscitate him and you look up and you see his wedding picture from 60 years ago. And then you look his spouse in the face knowing that her world is about to crumble. It's the little things, the gunshots, the stabbings, the mangled vehicles, the constant tragedy every single day. We see people at their worst. And probably one of the worst parts about our lives and our profession is our successes are hidden. Our failures are very public. So I have a good friend of mine who would tell you, suck it up, get over it. You knew what you signed up for, this was you. Nobody told you to do this, put a gun to your head to do this job. Suck it up. Stop playing the victim. Because people rely on you, people need you. They need you to be you. Not drop into the fetal position and suck your thumb every single time the radio goes off. 
Well, I will tell you, there are not many things in this world that I am good at, but I am damn good at this job. And no matter how bad I've gotten, no matter how dark my life has ever gotten, I've gotten up when that radio went off, and you will get my best. And as a matter of fact, I've gotten better. I've gotten more compassionate. I've gotten, I've become a better provider because I had an epiphany. About 12 years ago, I was working two full-time jobs. For those of you who aren't familiar with EMS, we used to call EMS earn money sleeping. I could go to a job and go and get a few good power naps. To this day, I can sleep better in a vehicle than I can in my own bed. <laughs> I can sleep better in a chair. But I was working two full-time jobs. I used to work a day tour in Corona, Queens, and then I used to go right to an overnight in South Jamaica. Not two very good areas if you're familiar with the area. When I was in the middle of a nap, it was a beautiful nap as a matter of fact, one of those really good mouth drying naps. And I got woke up for a hanging. And I was pretty burnt out at the time. So I went and I went to a house and there was a basement apartment and there was a gentleman who was five feet 11 inch tall trying to hang himself off of a six foot ceiling. For the record, that doesn't work. <laughs> so in my burnt out state, in my really poor state, my mental condition was so bad, it was so burnt, so Cajun, as we used to like to call it, I treated that man like crap. So as I was back in the ambulance into the ER bay, a good friend of mine, my hero, the man I wanted to be, the man everybody wanted to be, he was the life of every single party he went into. If you worked with him, it was wonderful. It was the best tour you'll ever have in your life. He actually had the best parties. Backed me in, I opened up the doors, my partner walked that gentleman into the ER. We didn't even give him the dignity of a stretcher. That's how bad it was. So my good friend, my hero, had said to me, what do you got? Ah, some jerk screaming for attention, tried to hang himself. And I got a verbal kick in the gut to one of the people who I respected most in this life, looked me in the face and said, wow. Turned to walk away. Well, I chased him down and said, hey, 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 how about an explanation? And his exact words to me were, wow. All these years I've known you, I didn't know just how big of an asshole you really are. He turned around and he walked away from me. Now, this is a man I spoke to one, two, three times a day. Depending on the sports season, <laughs> we would talk all the time. Never talk to me. He wouldn't speak to me. We finally got into the truck one day when I had to work with him. And after an awkward silence, I said, what happened? What's the deal? What did I do? And he woke me up like I've never been woke up before. He said to me, Tony, do you have any idea what must have been going through that man's head? You have any idea what he must have been thinking that death was his only relief from his pain? Even if it was a cry for help, it didn't matter. Death was the only relief he had. And then he told me something I couldn't believe. He told me how bad his depression is. Crippling depression. Depression that would make him literally be in bed for a week. He used to get hurt on the job. He wasn't hurt, couldn't get out of bed. It was right then and there that I knew you never know who you're sitting next to. You never know the demons that they're battling. And then he punched me in the face again. And he said, my friend, you're hurting. He said, you don't realize it yet, you haven't accepted it yet, but you're in trouble. You need help, you gotta get it soon. And it's funny the way life works sometimes because I didn't even know this because at my other full-time job, all of my friends were talking to my bosses and telling them, Tony's in trouble. There's something wrong. He's not acting right. He's in a bad, bad place. So I was forced to take a vacation. And that forced vacation really woke me up and I actually reconnected with my hero and we got some therapy for me. I started seeing a therapist and that fizzled out really bad because I was not ready to stop sucking it up and getting over it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't care. Self-reflection was... Who cares about self-reflection? Give me a break. I'm tough. I'm a paramedic. I am a New York City paramedic, damn it. I'm tougher than this. 
So what happened? I fell right back into the same destructive behaviors. Started working more, as a matter of fact. I had two full-time jobs and a part-time job. I was working roughly about 110 hours a week. So this is what happened. I was partying hard and working harder. Working hard, partying harder. So what, if I wasn't at work, I was at the bar. If I wasn't at the bar, I was at work. Every once in a while, we throw some golf in there too. But now that I think about it, there's a pretty big bar involved in golf as well. See a pattern? So I started drinking pretty heavily and it started getting worse and worse. And I started getting into a darker and darker place, but I had an outward persona that was wonderful. I was, I was a happy guy. I was my hero. I was putting on a facade. But deep down inside, I was terrible. I was hurting. I was in pain. And then I got a phone call that changed my life. Late one night, I received a phone call from someone and it was an apology. It was an apology for sexually abusing me when I was a child. Now, I remembered that, but never accepted it, never really went with it. Didn't want to deal with it. Suck it up, get over it. Well, I went into a deep despair. I went to fear, guilt. I felt guilty that this happened to me. I had no help, no support. Didn't want to talk to any of my friends about it. So guess what happened? I started drinking more. So fast forward about six months until I was in my darkest place. I'm sitting in my man cave, which I'm very proud of, by the way. In my man cave, highly intoxicated and ready. I took out a bottle of Vicodin. I poured the pills in my hand. That was it. I was done. The pain was too much. I couldn't do it anymore. I knew what that gentleman who tried to hang himself felt like. I knew that the only relief was to end it. And like a strike of lightning, my phone rang. 11.30 at night. It was a good friend of mine. He had to tell me about a story he just heard in the bar. You aren't going to believe this. You are never going to believe what he said. And we sat there and we talked and we talked and we talked and I laughed and laughed and laughed. And as I laughed, I put the Vicodin pills back in the bottle and I lived for another day. And there's one thing I've always overlooked. One thing I've never accepted, one thing I've never really done. And that's thank him for doing that. And he's here tonight. So thank you. He saved my life. I lived a little more time, and four and a half months later, my four-month-old daughter is sleeping two flights up. And she was a great baby. Unbelievable. That, that baby slept from the moment she walked, came home to the moment she turned about one or two. She actually, I keep saying, she suckered us into having the second, because now neither one of them will sleep. <laughs> Notice the bags under my eyes. And I was sitting down in my man cave again, intoxicated. See a pattern? And I couldn't take it anymore. The pain was just too much. And this baby, this child, who never woke up, who went to sleep at 8 o'clock and woke up at 9 in the morning, never stirred once. I poured those bottles, those pills in my hand, and she started screaming bloody murder. I had no idea what was going on. It scared the ever-living bejesus out of me. I've been a paramedic for most of my adult life. And when your children get hurt, oh, all bets are off. I become a blubbering idiot. So I ran upstairs, and I grabbed her out of her crib. And I started rocking her. We sat on our chair. I started playing John Mayer on my phone. Don't judge. She liked it. <laughs> and I looked down at her face. I said, she needs me. She needs me. So after that, I started to make a change. My wife, who has always been a supporter of mine, always listened to me, always been there to help me laugh, help me cry, always there to sometimes just not say anything. I needed to do it for her too. And I needed to know that I, this was going to be my chance. So I started calling therapists immediately. And for the record, I had already tried three therapists. But guess what? Luck would have it. The fourth time's a charm. And we clicked immediately. 
And she zeroed in immediately on my childhood because she said, your childhood is the reason that you're feeling the way you're feeling because of your job. Your childhood, that trauma, is because of everything that you've experienced. As a, this is what you have to fix. So after tons and tons of self-reflection, which hurt, and it was terrible, and it was awful, it was so painful, sometimes I couldn't speak after I was done, I started to get better. Prior to this, I had ballooned to 450 pounds. I was drinking a gallon of coffee a day. I even started chewing tobacco. I was committing suicide by food and alcohol. Well, I'm proud to say that after getting my head straight with my therapist and my family and friends, I'm 140 pounds lighter. I go to the gym five to six times a week. It's actually become somewhat of an obsession. And I don't suck it up anymore. I, know, I don't do that. I don't let anybody feel that they have to suck it up. I talk to everybody that will listen in regards to this. It's okay to not be okay. It is okay to be hurt. It is okay to feel emotion. It is okay to cry. It's okay. My wife and my best friend will tell you I cry more than I probably should. <laughs> but it's okay. I've lost a lot of friends to suicide. I've lost a lot of friends to drugs and alcohol. And I'll tell you, if one of them just had a friend that made a phone call at 11.30 at night to tell you a funny story. Maybe it would work. Maybe they'd still be here. If they had a four-month-old that screamed at just the right time, maybe they would be better. Maybe they wouldn't be fighting the demons that they're still fighting. Suck it up doesn't work. If you are in this field, if you know somebody, keep an eye on things. Make a phone call. Send a text message. Just check in. Sometimes the littlest things can make the biggest of difference. That's all I'm asking for. I won't give up. I won't stop. My wife knows that in the middle of the night, at 3 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings, it's somebody that needs to talk or somebody that needs me, I will get in my car and drive wherever I have to go. I will not let people be alone. I will not let them be the way I was in that man cave. I won't do it. So all I'm asking is you do the same. Suck it up doesn't work. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening.